Okay, one of the uh, big takeaways I've had from talking to students about the material that we're covering, especially in this, this kind of class or in CT, is that we need help kind of breaking this material down. So I sat down and I talked to you all about what does that mean to break the material down. I talked to the seniors about that. And, uh, and so I'm going to make some attempts to try to break this material down for us and make it more digestible without oversimplifying it, right? So I'll, I've got some metaphors in here that I've kind of come up with that'll hopefully help us. But um, we are looking at chapter 21 in our textbook. I think one of the first things that's helpful in terms of breaking stuff down is just to think about learning objectives. Um, so uh, I borrowed a lot of the language from the learning objectives in the textbook, but by the end of this PowerPoint or the end of this section, my goals for us and this is true when it comes to testing, so I look at these objectives when it comes time for me to make an exam, is that we can describe, hopefully in our own words, right, how the line focus principle is used to provide increased image sharpness, okay, um, as well as decreased image heat, heat load. Uh, so it does, it does two things. It allows us to decrease the Heat load to the anode and improves image sharpness. It's not a perfect solution, but it's pretty good. So we'll talk about some of its imperfections. Um, like, for example, how the line focus principle causes the image to be sharper at one end of the field versus the other. I've already had some student questions about that. That is not to be confused with the anode heel effect. That is a shortcoming of the line focus principle um, as we use it in the x-ray tube. But we will talk about the anode heel effect and the factors that make it worse, so what things make it better, how do we decrease it, those kinds of things. Um, and those, again, are things that we can hopefully have a solid illustration in our mind or something that allows us to kind of capture how that works. Uh, describe the cause of the, uh, I'm sorry, quantify the relationship between focal spot size and image penumbra. So I'll come up with another metaphor for that. And then finally, explain why focal spot size is considered the controlling factor for image sharpness. So any question about image sharpness, the first thing I'm thinking about as a technologist is focal spot size, okay? I will repeat that because that's kind of a big takeaway from this section. But first of all, let's talk about this line focus principle. I just kind of digested down some of what was in the textbook. Some of the terminologies that we need to be aware of is that there is an actual focal spot. There's the actual focal spot is an area available on the anode for the dispersion of heat generated during x-ray production. It's the area that the electrons are focused on on the anode in order to produce x-rays. Okay? Sometimes technologists will talk about, a, or in the test, they'll talk about the focal tract. Don't get thrown off by that. If you, if you remember, the anode is circular in shape, and so if I distribute, if the, the anode is spinning, then if you can imagine almost like a record, there's going to be a track around the anode that, show, that distributes the heat across all these various focal spots that we could have. Does that make sense? The electrons are lazy, though, so they're going to find the shortest path to jump from the cathode to the anode. So where they're actually hitting the anode, that is the actual focal spot. Now, what gets a little bit confusing is when we're talking about this as technologists, we generally, when we're talking about adjusting focal spot size, what we're really talking about changing is the effective focal spot size. And that effective focal spot size is produced by giving the anode an angle, okay? So the effective focal spot size from the textbook is controlled by both the width of the electron beam and the angle of the anode bev bevel. We're gonna need to define those terms really carefully, particularly effective focal spot size and anode bevel. But as a general rule of thumb, as, the, as we decrease the effective focal spot size, we will increase image sharpness. As we decrease the focal spot size, we're gonna increase image sharpness. So um, the way that we mess with that though, um, on the anode side, is we have will decrease that effective focal spot size by decreasing the anode bevel angle. So if we, now we need to ask, what the heck are we talking about with this anode bevel angle? If you look at your textbook on page 322, figure 2, um, 21.1 or 21.2, I'll go to the next slide and we'll look at it. 
Here's what I'm talking about. This anode bevel angle that we're talking about, um, let me draw on this slide real quick, like it illustrates on figure 21-1, is this angle here, if we were to draw a perpendicular line down along the top of the, of the anode and measure this angulation right here. As this angle becomes more acute, right, um, and so if I was a little ant trying to get up this slope right here, that slope is steeper, right? If I was a little tiny ant and I'm trying to climb up that slope right there, that, sto that slope is now much steeper than the other one, then I've shrunk the effective focal spot size. Because if you look, the measurement right here of the electron beam width is exactly the same. One way to maybe think about this is it's like a bank shot in pool. I'm banking it off of the anode in a way that changes how big it is, right? Um, the metaphor that I came up to think about this, it goes back to the woodchuck question, right? How much wood could a woodchuck chuck? Well, it depends on what kind of ax he has, right? Is one way to think about it. If we only, if, say I'm asking you to cut down a tree, and I say you have these two tools, you can either cut down the tree with a knife or the hatchet. Hopefully we will all choose the hatchet, right? Otherwise you just failed the Hunger Games and um, President Snow wins, right? So the knife though, say I ask you to cut a loaf of bread, then hopefully we're all picking up the knife. Think about body parts like that. If I'm trying to x-ray a person's hip or their femur, that's like chopping down a tree. I need to bring that bigger focal spot size. I need the, I need the ax to chop down the tree. If I'm trying to image something big, like a chest or an abdomen or a thigh or a hip, I need to bring the bigger focal spot size to bear on that, right? If I'm trying to image something that's detailed, like a coronary artery, wrist bones, right? Um, parts of the hand then I'll use the knife, right? Because it's gonna give me that much more accurate of a cut. So I think that's a helpful way to think about it. If you actually think about the way, um, if you know much about tools, you look at a knife blade versus a, a ax blade, the ax blade is actually fatter, right? Because it serves to split the wood, right? Versus the knife blade is very, very, it has that acute angle, right? So it is, it is using the exact same principle of what, what that we're talking about. Questions about that? Exactly. The, in this picture here, 21-2, this is the axe, this is the knife. So if you're looking at, at get out an axe blade in your garage and look at the axe blade, it's, it's fatter than a knife blade, okay? Hopefully that helps us kind of break this down. All right, so we need to talk about this projected focal spot, right? Because it, it's not perfect. It's an okay solution, but it has one technical hurdle to it. And so he talks about in the book, imagine that you've shrunk yourself down and you're standing on the image receptor and you're somehow looking up at the anode, right? You've got this giant anode spinning over you. As I go to, as I walk across the image receptor over to the cathode side of the tube and I look up at that anode, it's going to look much bigger. And then if I walk back over towards the anode side and I look up at the anode, it's going to get smaller, right? That's the exact same thing that we're talking about. It's the same principle as, um, for example, if you're looking at this from one angle versus this angle. So if I'm standing on the cathode side of the x-ray tube and I'm looking up at the anode, I'm going to see something that looks like this. I'm going to see a bigger, flatter surface. Whereas if I'm standing right underneath the anode and looking up at it, I'm seeing something that's pretty narrow, right? What that means in terms of the way x-rays work is that you can see that narrowing here on this illustration on page 323. That here again, I'm an ant sitting on the uh, image receptor looking up at the cathode. I see this big thing, right? Versus if I walk over here to this side and I look up at it, I see this little narrow thing, right? Um, so 
the apparent size changes relative to the angle of projection is the fancy scientific way of saying that. The apparent size changes relative to the angle of projection. That is an aspect of this effective focal spot size or this, line, this uh, line focus principle. Okay? Now, it's, I, one thing I like about this illustration he points out is that there is only one effective focal spot, right? It is the one that is directly perpendicular to the actual focal spot. It does not have an S after it. It says effective focal spot. There's only one of them. There are a number of different projected focal spots, right? Any one of these other things are ways that are being projected towards the image receptor, okay? So the, the reason I stress that grammar is because the effective focal spot is very carefully defined, right? And it is what we wanted. It's the whole reason we did the stupid angle thing to begin with. The projected focal spots are a shortfalling of it, right? It's not quite perfect, in other words. Um, so the an long story short, the anode end of the image is sharper than the cathode end of the image. You may be wondering, who the heck cares? The people that care, who, who doesn't want to have a heart attack, right? Hopefully everyone's hand goes up. We don't want to have a heart attack. <laughs> the people who care are cardiologists. That's who cares. So if they care, do I need to care? Yes, I do. Because the ones who are really, really tight on the whole projected focal spot, effective focal spot stuff are the people in the cardiac cath lab. They are messing with focal spots and trying to get that anode be bevel even more acute, right? Because I just said, I want you to slice the bread with the knife. Now get me a knife that can slice something even finer, that can work on a watch or something complex, right? Um, so we're talking about our hearts now. As we increase that bevel, we're increasing spatial resolution because we're trying to Im image cardiac arteries and things like that. So those are the people who really care. And they really care if you walk into that cardi uh, cardiac cath suite and you've got the patient's head on the wrong end of the table, guess what? You're going to get your butt handed to you because they know about this. Right? So I want to see us succeed in that regard, anyone who's interested in interventional. All right, switching gears a little bit, let's talk about the anode heel effect. This is a totally different thing, right? Um, so the anode heel effect um, is variations in x-ray intensity along the longitudinal tube axis. Now, I know that's kind of fancy, um, nerdy language, right? But that does come right out of our textbook on page 323. And it is probably the best way to think about it. One, another way to think about it graphically is the figure 21.4 at the top of page 324. Basically, what it means is we're making x-rays, and they can see through anything, right? They can't see through the freaking anode, right? The anode's a heavy metal. So as I'm producing x-rays, um, the x-rays can actually get trapped inside the anode, the very thing that I made them in, right? Um, so that would cause the intensity of the x-ray beam to diminish as I move from the central ray towards the anode side of the tube, right? That's why we call it the anode heel effect. Um, so the anode, in other words, acts as a form of inherent filtration. It's filtering out some of these x-rays. And since it's a heavy metal, it can filter out some pretty high energy x-rays. Um, as we get high, sh smaller and smaller effective focal spot sizes. As we make that anode bevel more and more acute, we are increasing the heel effect. We are increasing the heel effect. So that's the second reason you would get your butt chewed out by the cardiologist if you set the patient up wrong. The first one was the image looks less sharp. The second one is you've just reduced the amount of intensity in the area where they might want it, right? So as I, as I decrease that anode bevel, right, as I decrease that angulation, as I make the angle more acute, I'm increasing the heel effect, right? Um, and it's more apparent when we use the large focal spot than the small focal spot. Those are some, those are some just things to think about when I think about the anode heel effect. Um, I know that some, say, some folks say this is not the most important part of the material. I would still say it's, it's very testable. 
It's a highly testable concept, so the ART continues to love it. I'm not trying to teach to the test, but just be aware this is a highly testable concept. As a general rule of thumb, though, in terms of the way we work with this in the, in the diagnostic x-ray suite, we place the thinnest end of anatomy towards the anode side of the x-ray tube. It does influence the way that we make CT machines. And it does matter if we're scanning head first or feet first because of this. But um, if I were to try to think about how do I break this down, we are in love with videos of people being hit in the face with balls, right? It is just, if you go to YouTube and search this, you can watch endless numbers of videos about this. It is what I think about when I think about the anode heel effect. So this poor unfortunate young lady is being hit in the head with a ball. The likelihood of that ball getting to her right hand side has just been diminished by its impact with her head, right? The ball ain't bouncing this way. There might be a few that bounce this way, because we know from watching all these videos, the balls do funny things when they bounce, right? It's not just that it smacked this person in the face, it's that it went off and it smacked someone else in the face as well, right? So it is very likely the ball is going to bounce in this direction, in some which way. It is less likely it's going to go in this way. So if this were the anode heel effect, the cathode's right here, launching electrons at her, she's the anode, Right? And her body is basically blocking the x-ray that's being produced from getting over to this side, the anode side. Does that make sense? Um, questions about this really dumb way of breaking this down? Okay. It's the best picture of someone getting hit in the face of the ball I could find. Some of them were more gross or weirder. I think this one was actually staged. Okay, focal spot size. It's kind of the last big takeaway for this section. Um, and it's important that it falls where it does uh, because what we're trying to make an argument for is what is the best way we can control sharpness of the image. So everything I just said about effective focal spot, the anode heel effect, the big conversation, the big reason we're having all of this is we're trying to improve image sharpness. What kind of detail can I see in the picture? Some of the things that we're fighting are the fact that the, we can overheat the anode. So we're using principles to allow for heat distribution, right? We can overeat the cathode. We can burn out a filament wire, right? So we are using certain principles to try to combat those heat overload things. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, and we've, we've shot the x-ray, the primary way to affect the image's image sharpness quality is going to be the size of the effective focal spot. And so again, as technologists are talking about this, small focal spot, large focal spot, they're generally talking about, they're generally referring to the effective focal spot, okay? Um, but the focal spot is the only technical factor that, that just exclusively affects image sharpness. It's the only thing that I have direct technical control over that exclusively affects image sharpness. That's all it does. It just affects how sharp the image is. The smaller the focal spot, the sharper the recorded detail, right? So you, then you might ask, well, why, do, why don't we just have one really small focal spot and one really highly angled anode and be done with this whole stupid conversation, right? Well, the problem goes back to the heat, right? If we only had the small focal spot, we would not have the ability in terms of in, just pure engineering to create a tube that could still withstand the heat units needed to x-ray like a hip or a chest, okay? So it's a heat problem. The larger focal spots are capable of withstanding higher tube heat. Don't trip up on that, okay? Because there's a lot of, registry knows that this is a thorny issue, right? Because some of what you might be thinking in the back of your head is that because um, this is the way it translates to, technical, to clinical practice, is anytime I'm using a high mass, I want the larger focal spot, right? But the focal spot does not have any control over the mass at all. It, does not, it, it is not a controlling factor for mass. It is not a controlling factor for image contrast or brightness or magnification or anything like that. Uh, all it controls is just that image sharpness, okay? So don't get tricked up on that. So I wanted to make sure that we understand, number one, focal spots directly proportional to penumbra. 
But finally, focal spot does not affect image magnification, shape distortion, exposure, contrast, or noise. It doesn't do any of that stuff. Do we change the focal spot if I'm using a hotter technique? Yes. Why? Because it's a hotter technique. It's just the heat. I'm just trying to make sure I don't burn out my anode or my cathode. You just don't want to burn those things out. Now, does it change the penumbra? Yes, it does. Um, but the effect on the umbra is minimal, absolutely minimal. So at the end of the day, what he says after a whole lot of talk, don't worry about magnification. Right? That's the big takeaway there. Um, but if you are interested in what he's talking about, or maybe a definition or a better way to understand penumbra as it relates to focal spot size, I would just go back to thinking about umbrellas and rain clouds. Umbrella, of course, um, comes from the same Latin root as umbra, right? So if you're holding an umbrella up, right, the umbra is the true shadow. It's what actually the umbrella covers, right? The umbra is what the umbrella covers, right? In this illustration, the penumbra is that kind of additional area of decreased raindrops that you would get if you are st like you know you're you're standing with your friend and you hold the umbrella over towards them, right? Are they completely covered by the umbrella? No, but they're in the penumbra of the thing, right? So it's like that's sharing the umbrella with your friend, right? If I really want to think about what that means in terms of focal spot sizes, what I need to mess around with is kind of the size of the rain cloud, though, right? So this is where this is kind of a weird metaphor. But I've said that the, um, pen, the umbra is the area directly beneath the uh, umbrella, right? So this is my umbra right here. The penumbra is the kind of additional area caused by this angulation of kind of maybe some additional coverage that a friend might get or whatever. If I change the, uh, the size of the rain cloud right here, right? So I've got that rain cloud right there. And he's, this, now I'm messing with my focal spot size, right? Nothing, if, if I bring in, you know, the mother of all rain clouds now, right? This is a giant rain cloud, not a brain. And it's just pouring rain. Um, what I messed with when I, when I changed the rain clouds out was not this area right here, right? I did not mess with the actual umbra all that much. But I just significantly increased the penumbra, right? I just significantly increased um, the area of splash or whatever coming off this thing because it's raining that much harder, right? So this is not a perfect metaphor, but it's maybe helpful. So if we're asked questions about why, how does focal spot size control sharpness? It did not do it by messing with the umbra. It did it by messing with the penumbra. So I, on the smaller rain cloud, I have this smaller penumbra, right? Versus the larger rain cloud, I have a much larger area of penumbra. Does that make sense? So uh, any questions about that? Okay, thank you all so much for your attention.